Hello everyone, it's Benny, and in this video, we are going to implement textures. So, first off, I'm going to create a new class for our textures. I'm going to call it Texture. And in my Texture class, I'm going to have Public Texture, and I'm just going to initialize it with an int ID. This is going to be like the pointers we've had before, where this is like a pointer to where it is on the graphics card. So, we can have just private end ID, this dot ID equals ID, and I'm going to have public void, whoops, get ID, return ID. So that's really most of what I, wait, public end get ID, there we go. And really this is most of what I want with the texture class. The only other thing I want is a bind method, so that I can use this texture. I can start drawing with it. So, public void bind. Now, binding requires some OpenGL code, so I'm going to import static org.lwjgl.opengl.gl11.star. And in the bind method, I'm just going to do gl bind texture, and this takes two parameters. First parameter is what target I want to bind it to. So, and I want to bind it to GL Texture 2D. Say this is a 2D texture I'm using. And second parameter is the texture ID, so it's the ID, of course. And there you go. That really completes a texture class. That's all I care about for now. Now, of course, the question is, how do I get this texture ID that I create my texture with? And that's going to come from our resource loader when we load the texture. And that can be collapsed. So, I'm going to create public static texture load texture. I'm taking some string file name. And the first thing I want to do here is I want to create, well, yeah, I'll create the try catch statement. So, try catch some exception e, e.printStackTrace. And then system.exit1. And if we, manage, if we don't manage to load the texture, I'm going to return null. Otherwise, the code's going to be in the try statement. Now, in order to actually load the texture, I need to know which file formats it's in. So I'm going to do the same thing I did with, well, our mesh loader, this thing, to get the file extension. And in fact, I'm just going to use that code directly. So, the split array, and the file extension. Now, to actually load the texture, I'm going to use Slick Utils texture loader. So texture loader, which is a class from stick ut Slick Util, dot get texture. And for the format, I'm going to use the file extension. And the input stream, I'm going to do new file input stream, which takes in a new file. And in this new file, I'm going to take in a similar sort of thing that I've been doing. Whoops. Okay, that's not what I intended. There we go. It's going to have some folder for it, dot, sl dot res slash textures, plus the file name. And, of course, I want to import this. So import file, and import file input stream. And I'm missing something, aren't I? No? Okay. Then, okay, good. So that'll get me a texture in the slick util format. But I don't want it in the slick util format. I just want the texture ID, so get texture ID. I'll just call it int ID equals that, and then I'm going to return a new texture taking in that ID. And there you go. That loads in a texture with the appropriate texture ID. <coughs> now that I actually can load textures though, I want to go to my render util class and create a m new method public static void set textures takes in some boolean value. Well, I'll say boolean enabled. Eh, yeah, it's it's a boolean value. You can call it whatever you want. And if this value is saying enabled, then I want to gl enable gl texture 2d and else gl disable gl texture 2d. And there that's the method. 
It's just sort of a method for me to easily be able to enable or disable the usage of textures without having to worry about importing OpenGL. And of course, in my initialize graphics method, I want to change something. I want to start off with enabling Geo Texture 2D. That way, well, I'm I start off using textures. And yeah, so now that all that's set up, I, I should be able to go into my game class and do a pretty basic test of textures. So just for now, I'm going to go back to using our generated manually input mesh. So back to this. And just to test that to make sure that's actually working, I'm going to run. And um, uh, it's a little bit inverted, but it's kind of working. <laughs> yeah, I can go ahead and fix that later. That's not the big issue right now. The big issue is, what if I load a texture? How does it know, say, how to draw a texture on a 3D triangle? And the answer is, well, it doesn't. It doesn't know how to project some 2D image onto a 3D object. So we have to tell it that using texture coordinates. So every vertex is going to take in a new vector 2f for texture coordinates. So for example, this one might be at 0, 0. And say, this one might be at 0 0.5, comma 0. Well, 0 0.5f, comma 0. And maybe, I don't know, this one's at 1, comma 0. And essentially, these are coordinates on the texture, where 0, 0 is the bottom left corner, and 1, 1 is the upper left corner if I remember correctly. So, and finally, um, yeah, z 0, comma, 0 0.5. There. I don't know, just some texture coordinates. And of course, it's giving me an error because my vertex can't handle all that data right now. It only takes in a position. So, guess what? We're going to be expanding our vertex class a little bit. And, of course, I'm going to create a new vector 2f for my text chord. Going to generate getters and setters for that. And, yeah, at the end. And I'm also going to create a new constructor, one which takes in a vector 3f and a vector 2f called text chord, where this dot text chord equals text chord. And in this constructor, I'm going to change this to say this sum of subpass and vector 2f, 0, 0. And new vector 2f. There. And that should give me, well, a new way of working the vertex. But first off, do not forget to change the size, because now I have four floating point numbers. 3 plus 2 is 5, so... Make sure to change that. And, yeah. So, now that we have our new data, we of course need to change our mesh class to use this new data. So yeah, there's a little bit of a ripple effect, but don't worry. It's not too bad once it's all said and done. In our add vertices method, you might think we need to change something, because, you know, well, our vertices have more data now, so we of course want to add that new data into our buffer. And actually, we don't need to change this. And this is where you have to be really careful and where I've screwed up every single time I've done this before. Because all the extra data is added in this util.createFlippedBuffer method. So I have to go to my util class and change the createFlippedBuffer methods to add the extra data. So buffer.put vertices sub i dot get texture coordinate dot dot get x and the same for y. Make sure to do this, or you will surely run into issues later. So yeah, that is how you add all the extra data in. It's not done in the mesh class. So yeah, now that all the extra data is added into our vertices, all we really have to change is the draw method, which isn't as bad as it really seems, because all we need to say is, hey, we have more data than just our position. We need a new vertex attribute pointer, takes in 2, and all we really need to worry about here, 
since most of this, you know, it's the same, it's still floating point data, is this, the offset. Where do our texture coordinates start? So, how are we physically, in the memory of the computer, storing our vertex? Well, first we have three floating point numbers for our pos position, and then we have two floating point numbers for our texture coordinate. So, we need to figure out how many bytes three floating point numbers take up, because we want to start at the texture coordinate data, not the position data. A floating point number is four bytes, and we have three of them for the position, so four times three is twelve. We want to start twelve bytes into it to get the vertex, not the vertex, the texture coordinate data. And other than that, this is a new attribute to the vertex, so we want to put it in a new vertex attribute array. So I'm going to create a new one, put it in vertex attribute 1 rather than 0. And really, that should be everything we need to change with our mesh and our vertex to get texture coordinates working. So I'm going to go ahead and create our test texture. I'm going to create new texture. I'm going to make it 512 by 512. It's important that these numbers are exponents of 2, or OpenGL may have some trouble with it. Well, Slick Util handles it, but it's probably not the way you want it to handle it, so just make sure you have nice exponent of 2 texture size. And here, I'm going to generate a grid. Not quite that intense. Maybe, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. That seems eh, fairly reasonable, I suppose, so get that lined up. There. And I'm just going to take the paint bucket tool and fill in every other one of these in a checkerboard pattern. And this is going to be my test texture. Nothing too fancy to it, just basic checkerboard. So, I'm going to go ahead and save, and put it on my desktop as test.png. And there. That, whoa, oh, oh. And yeah, I don't really care about the settings. And that's my test texture. Now, in my project folder, I'm going to go to my resource, I'm going to create a new folder called textures, and I'm going to move my texture I just created, the test.png, in here. And that should be all the setup I really need before I go in here and start testing out my texture. So I went ahead and corrected my indices off camera. So you can use those if you really care. And now I'm going to create private texture texture. Texture equals resource loader dot load texture test dot png. And there, we've loaded the texture. In order to actually use it, right before I draw my mesh, my mesh, I'm just going to do test dot bind. Wait, texture dot bind. And we're going to see what happens. Absolutely nothing. You know why? Because in our shaders, we aren't actually using the texture color. We'll st we're still telling it, hey, use this generated color. So we're going to have to change our shader around a little bit so that it uses our textured information. And that's going to be our next task. So in my shader, I'm going to take in some new data for my vertex. It's going to be in attribute array 1, and it's going to be a vec2, I'll call it text chord. And instead of outputting a color, I'm just going to go ahead and get rid of that. I'm going to output a vec2, I'll just call text chord 0. And here, I'm just going to straight up send my text chord to my fragment shader by using this text chord 0 vector. And there you go. That's all I care about doing in my updated vertex shader. And in our fragment shader, I'm going to make a vector 2D, texture chord 0, and that's just going to replace the color variable. And I'm also going to take in a uniform sa ampler 2D called sampler. And this essentially tells us where to read the texture data from. I'm not going to bother with setting this right now since it defaults to 0. And right now, I'm pretty sure it's saving the textures by default in location 0. 
So I'm not going to bother with it right now. So, but I'm going to have it there just in case I want to read textures from different locations later on. So anyways, now in my fragment color, I'm going to set this to texture 2D that will read from some sampler, some location, at some texture coordinates, which I'll say are texture coordinate 0 dot x, y, so the x and y parts of the texture coordinate, which is all I care about. And that should complete our fragment shader. And as I discovered, that previous texture wasn't the best texture to test with because it involved pure black and our background was pure black. So yeah, I've changed it up a little bit to be hopefully a little bit more clear. Now, I'm going to go ahead and test. Let's see what happens. And as you see, I've got... It's textured. It's got the brown part of that on it. It's not perhaps the most interesting thing since it's a single color, but, you know, it's there. So let's go ahead and try changing it up. Let's try using a different texture, seeing if we can get more than one color showing, because, you know, I sort of just came up with the texture coordinates on the fly. So, yeah. Let's see what happens. And as it turns out, the reason I was only seeing a single color was because of this line of code right here. Texture chord 0 equals texture chord 0. Any ideas why this might be a bit of a problem? Yeah, I want the texture coordinates passed in, not just setting it to itself. And if I do this, now it should give me a properly textured triangle pyramid. So, let's see what happens. And there you go. I'm getting some texturing going on. Again, the texture coordinates are sort of, you know, not perfect, as you can see by that. But if you create textures coordinates in a model viewer thing, which I'll talk about a little bit later, don't want to talk about modeling and importing texture coordinates just yet, then, well, it's a little bit, you know, more useful. So yeah, there you go. That's how you get basic texturing. Hope you enjoyed, hope you learned, and see you next time.